So many times we find ourselves in difficulty in life and we don't exactly understand why. And sometimes here we are Christians and we've started living the Christian walk the best we understand over a period of time. And yet it seems like everything seems to be crumbling around us and we don't understand what's going on. And this happened to an ancient king in Israel. And if you want to read about it, turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 through 13. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1, to 13, 1 through 13. And it came to pass after this that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them besides the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. So here was a king of Judah and this man thought he was, quote, in the faith because after all he had a temple right there. He had the books of the law right there. They kept the holy days every year. You know, so he thought he was in the faith. But all of a sudden, it seemed that his entire empire around him was about to crumble because these three other nations had joined armies together in an alliance. And here they were coming against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, this is verse 2, There comes a great multitude against you from beyond the sea on this side Syria. And behold, they be in... Uh-oh, what a name... <laughs> has a Zan Tamar, and anyway, there's a group of people coming, and he describes where they're coming from. Verse 3, and Jehoshaphat feared. And isn't that exactly what happens to us in most cases? When something suddenly surrounds us, and it seems like our entire life is on the line, whether it's physically, spiritually, politically, you know, whatever it's going to be in our life, whatever's happening to us, all of a sudden, fear absolutely grips us because it is unknown as the circumstances and to how it's going to come out. So Jehoshaphat feared, but he did do one smart thing. Look what he did. He set himself to seek the Lord. That was the one thing that he did that was smart. He set himself to seek the Lord and look what else he did. He proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. A fast throughout all Judah. Now, verse 4, And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. So this wasn't just one man's problem. This was a national problem. So Jehoshaphat just laid it before all the people and he said, Look, we've got to seek the Lord our God, which we seldom do. We may come to him in prayer occasionally. We may call out his name occasionally, usually in profanity when our crops aren't growing properly, you know, and the rain doesn't come at the right time. But we're going to change things. You see, prayer changes things. And so he said, I'm going to set my face to seek the Lord. I'm going to proclaim a fast through all Judah and everyone who has the heart and who wants to see this problem alleviated I'm going to ask you to join with me. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Verse 5, And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord before the new court, and said, O Lord God, our fathers are not, or of our fathers, art not you God in heaven? So he wanted to know, are you there? I'm going to seek you, and I want to know if you'll give me an answer. So I'm going to seek you. And he says, and you rule not over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in your hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand you? And I'm going to bring it down on an even a more personal level to us today as Christians. There is a satanic world, an unseen world of demons, spirit, witchcraft, and this type of thing that's absolutely flooding society. And there are certain games, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, which actually take you step by step how to conjure up demons, how to command them, and so on, and how to draw them up and to help you. And then there's a couple of boys even committed suicide because they saw no way of getting out of the game other than following the instructions in Demons and Dragons, and that was to kill themselves. That was their only way to get out of the game. Well, this man was asking, God, are you there? Don't you have the supernatural power? You control all nations and all the events that are going to occur in the nations. You can change things if you choose. Verse 7, Art not you our God? 
who did drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel, and you gave it to the seed of Abraham, your friend, forever. So he was laying it right on the line to God. He, he, he admitted, as we're going to see in the context, hey, I haven't come to you, I haven't prayed to you, I haven't submitted myself to you. Our whole nation hasn't done that, but now we're coming as a unified group, and we're going to proclaim a fast, and we're going to jointly with one voice come to you and seek your face. Verse 8, And they dwelt therein, this is talking about the children of Israel, and have, and have built you a sanctuary therein for your name, saying, If when evil comes upon us as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before his, this house, and in your presence, for your name is in this house, and cry unto you in our affliction, then you will hear and help. So they finally, for the first time in a many, many years, decided they would cry out to God to save their nation. And they proclaimed a fast in order, to help, in order to help them in this particular effort. Verse 10, And now behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came into the land, from the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of your possession which you have given us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that comes against us, neither know we what to do. So they felt absolutely helpless. And he says, and notice this is very important, for our eyes are upon you. God only. That's who was going to be their salvation. There was no one else that could help them. Verse 13, And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. It was a joint assembly, and people were going to proclaim a fast, and they were going to seek God. Now, let's drop down to verse... Well, first of all, I want to summarize what we've seen here. First of all, they feared God because something got... Jehoshaphat's attention that he could not handle in his own private life. So he sought additional help. And he said, there is only one source of help that I can turn to, and that's God. And then the second thing he did was he sought himself personally to seek the Lord. And from there, he proclaimed all through Judah because he was king and the people were subject to him. And they followed his directions and they all fasted. And they all sought jointly the face of God together. And then to show he meant business, he proclaimed a fast throughout the land. A fast. Now, what is a fast? Number 6685 in the strong concordance of the Hebrew language says to cover the mouth. It's literally a covering over a mouth. You're not to eat any food or any water. And this was what was going to take place. And in this particular instance, not even the children were allowed to eat food and drink water. This is the kind of business, and this was an emergency at hand. And so Jehoshaphat was going to show God that it meant business. They were, as a nation, going to seek his face. Now, let's drop on down to verse 15 to 18 right quick. And he said, Hearken, or listen, you all, Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you King Jehoshaphat, you, thus says the Lord, this is a prophet who came to him. Thus says the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but the Lord's. It's God's battle. Tomorrow go you down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jerel. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand you still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bed, or bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Now this is what took place after they set their face. First of all, they went into action and said, Look, Lord, this is too much for us. 
These people are too great for us. They're going to overthrow us. They're going to take us into national captivity. They're going to maim. They're going to rape our women. They're going to kill our children. They're going to destroy the kingly line. Do something. And first of all, they feared God and they set their face toward Him and then they proclaimed a fast to show they meant business. Only after they fasted and went to God as a whole group did God come with an answer from a prophet. And He said, look, I've heard you. I'm going to deliver you from the circumstances. Now, verse 20. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tico. And as they went, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God. That's faith. So shall you be established. Believe this, his prophets. So shall you prosper. You see, belief. But first of all, they had to seek God with all of their heart, soul, and mind. They had to put God first, not themselves. They couldn't let themselves get in their way of an answer from God. Now, let's examine exactly what fasting is briefly. In Ezra chapter 8. Well, first, before I do that, I want to read yet another verse before we go on through that. Let's look at verse 21 and read on down because this is going to give us some comfort. Verse 21 to 25. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord because he had already been given the uh, knowledge that he's going to be the victor and that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and say, Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. And when they began to sing to praise, the Lord set ambushments about against the children of Ammon Moab and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. So you see, God intervened on their behalf. But even before the answer came, he appointed singers and so on to praise God and to give him the glory because of what he knew was already going to happen. The victory was theirs. Then let's drop down to verse 24. And when Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, there were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels, which they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering of the spoil. It was so much. So God tremendously blessed these people because first of all, they turned. They saw there was an obstacle standing in their way. They couldn't handle it by themselves. They sought God, put Him first, and said, You're our only source of deliverance. And then they fasted. Now, chapter 8 of Ezra. Chapter 8 of Ezra. Let's see the results of sincere fasting. Sincere fasting. But first, let's see what fasting really is. We've already seen that it means to cover the mouth. In Ezra 8, verse 21 to 23, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahav, that we might afflict ourselves before our God, to seek of Him a right way for us, and for our little ones, and for all our substance. Now notice what was happening here. First of all, they proclaimed a fast, a covering of the mouth. But why? And it also says, to, uh, they afflicted themselves. When you look up that word, it literally means a looking down or brow beating or to depress or abase through humbling yourself. Amen. So first of all, they said, let's proclaim a fast. And through that fasting, they were going to afflict themselves by humbling themselves and realizing that they were nobody. They were nothing but a grasshopper in the sight of God. And what can any of us do? I can't change my kinky hair, gray hair, from the way it is to slick and smooth. I can't do that. You see, I have no power to do that. I'm what I am. You're what you are. Neither one of us have any power to change what we are. Now, we can get an education. We can better ourselves in society, physically. But when it comes to salvation, the death penalty is already upon us. You and I are as good as dead unless God intervenes in our life and erases that through Jesus Christ. And so here a fast was being proclaimed so that they might, notice, to seek of God a right way for us. Plural, 
all of us and for our little ones and for all our substance. And I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way. Because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. Notice, that seek him. Doesn't just carry his name, profess him in profanity, or even sit in the church houses and say, Oh, praise God, then walk away and they live like the heathen people. Oh no, God will never hear that person. But his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. So first of all, I think we need to realize that they first of all were seeking a right way. That's one of the purposes of fasting. It's not seeking your way. It's not me seeking my own way saying, Lord, I already know what I'm going to do. Now I'm going to ask you if it's all right. That's not what fasting is all about. A fasting is to humble the self so the self can be removed from the circumstances and we can get our eye on God and say, you show me the way. You show me. Now, how do we fast, though? The word means to cover the mouth. We've already seen that. Turn to Esther, which is just somewhere in here, a few books later, a little small book. Esther chapter 4, after Nehemiah, verse 16. And she'll tell us what to do. Verse 15 says, Then Esther bade them return Mordecai the, his answer. Verse 16, Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast you for me. All right, they were going to have a specific purpose and treat God for a reason. Notice what they did. And neither eat nor drink. That means total abstinence from those things which go into the human body that keep it alive. And when we do this, it lets us realize that if we did not eat nor drink, our body would decay and rot and we would die. Our lives are but a vapor. You take away that physical substance that feeds it, proteins, fats, and oils, and things of that nature, carbohydrates, take it away from a short period of time and you die. You and I are nothing but a vapor. We're here today and gone tomorrow. We're like the grass that's burned. And so... When we come to God in a fast, it's literally humbling ourselves and afflicting ourselves and saying, look, we realize we don't have the answers. You are the one that can provide them. That's why we're seeking your face for the answer because you're eternal. You have no beginning of days, no end of days. You've created the whole life process. You've created the salvation process. Therefore, we're humbling ourselves before you. Now, in Isaiah chapter 58... This is a very startling chapter because these people were the children of Israel. And yet God detested their fasts. He did not appreciate their fast at all because they came seeking their own ways. They didn't seek what was the truth of God, how they could change and become godly people. Starting in verse 1 through 12. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. And show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. This is the setting for this whole chapter. And so somebody has to stand up, cry aloud, spare not, show the whole nation their sins or else it's going under. And if that group of people which says, God, we volunteer, we'll do whatever you say, under any circumstances, we're going to seek your face. We want you to show us how to do it. Then it's going to require somebody that's willing to fast to seek God's answer. I want to have a special prayer right now. Would you bow your head? Eternal Heavenly Father, we look out across the land of the United States, the British Commonwealth, the free world as we call it, and we realize that sin is running rampant. This nation has lost its way. It has been deliberately pulled into sin. It's being taught through the school systems today and their change agents without even their knowledge, in most cases, situation ethics, that they can sin, that our young people can turn their back upon you and they can live any way they want. As a result, you've left this nation as a whole and it doesn't even know it yet. So, Father, what I'm coming to you in special prayer for today is that you will show us as we seek your face 
what we can do and how we can cry aloud and spare not and show this nation their sins and you provide the way because you look down upon us and see that we're but few in number. None of us have any substance and there is only one way that this voice is going to go out. Our magazine will go out and warn this nation of its utter collapse and that is by the power of Almighty God and your Son, Jesus Christ. There is no other way. This nation has so accelerated its death that we must do something quickly, and that can only come by your power and no other. So, Father, I'm giving this sermon today on fasting and how to seek your face so that we as a group can do that together, so that we can cry aloud to this nation so that some may turn, because if they don't, they too will die in their own sins. So we thank you and honor you and extol your name and lift it up because there is no other name in the universe but God the Father and Jesus Christ whom he sent. And it is in Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Now let's continue. We want to see the type of fast that these people cannot or they had that we cannot afford to have. Verse 2. Yet they seek me daily. Look at this. Here are people, the children of Israel, the descendants of Jacob, and this prophecy is for the end time. And so this is for the United States of America. They seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness. Notice, past tense, that did it in the past and forsook not the ordinance of their God. So at one time, this was a holy Christian nation. They didn't understand everything, but at least they had things in perspective. God first in their life. They ask of me the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Okay, this is the background now, and yet God said, Look, you better stand up and cry aloud and show them their sins. This is the people that did seek me. They wanted to know truth. Now, look what these same people now are saying. Verse 3, Wherefore have we fasted? Why have we fasted? Say they, and you see not. Look, God, we're fasting to you, and you're not even looking. You're not listening. Wherefore or why? Have we afflicted our soul? Why have we humbled ourselves? And you take no knowledge. You don't even pay attention to us. Behold, in the day of your fast, this is what God's saying now, in the day of your fast, you find no pleasure and exact all your labors. Wow. Here in the days of our fast in this nation, we say, all oh, us fast. And so everybody runs around and everybody makes sure that their neighbor knows they're fasting. They make sure they know it. Because you see, I'm godly and I'm fasting. So I'm going to make sure everybody knows I'm fasting. And he says, look, you exact your labors. You go out and you do your own pleasure when you fast. Behold, you fast for strife and debate. It's a wrong kind of fast. They're not fasting to seek God, but they're fasting so that their neighbor will see the truth from my point of view. You see, I'm righteous in God's sight. Therefore, everybody's got to see everything scripturally just like I do. And that's exactly what's going on in this nation. That's why there's 843 different Christian churches. And they all say, I'm right. And I wish everybody else could get just like me. We're all wrong. We're all wrong in our attitudes. We have certain knowledge that may be more than somebody else. But still, you have knowledge without that humble spirit. It doesn't do you any good. None whatsoever. Behold, in the day of your fast you find pleasure and exact all your labors. Behold, you fast for strife and debate to smite with a fist of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day. God says, look, I'm sick with your fast to make your voice to be heard on high. I'm not going to hear that kind of fast. Is it such a fast that I've chosen? A day, when a, man to, a, a, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? Verse 6, is not this the fast that I've chosen? He contrasts the way people fast for their own benefit instead of seeking the truth of God and humbling themselves and changing or be converted. They're not seeking God's way, God's answer. Is not this the fast I've chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness? This is conversion. To undo the heavy burdens, help our neighbor, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. 
This is what we're supposed to be doing when we're fasting and seeking God's way. Have true justice toward every person we ever meet. Never an attitude of hatred. Never an attitude of self-righteousness. I'm better than you are. But only that of breaking the bonds because people are not only in physical bondage to the debt system today, they're in spiritual bondage to Satan. And none of us are any better because at one time before our baptism, we walked down that road. Verse 7. Is it not to deal your bread to the hungry? Help those who are in need when we can. I realize there's times when we cannot help somebody. But there are times when we can. And that you bring the poor that are cast out to the house, to your house. When you seek, see the naked, that you cover him. That you hide not yourself from your own flesh. You don't just look at someone like Jesus said in Matthew, those that are going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. He says, well, well what did we do to, in, to uh, inherit the kingdom? He said, when I was in prison, you came and visited me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was hungry, you fed me. Exactly what this says. When we fast, it's for total repentance and a change of our life. Not God to change and so we can get our way. Verse 8. Then shall your light break forth as the morning, and your health shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rearward. People are going to know God is with us if we fast with the right perspective in mind. Verse 9. Then shall you call... This is after the right and the proper fast, you see. And the Lord shall answer. You shall cry and he shall say, here I am. If you take away from the midst of you the yoke, the putting forth of the finger and speaking vanity, let's stop right there. Because there is a movement in the Christian community today that is a nauseating to God. I would just about say that he throws up twice a day because of the Christians today. Look what he said there. I don't know if we even comprehended it. If you take away from the midst of you the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, the pointing of the finger, and saying, I'm in poverty over here. Here's one person. I'm having trouble. And so here are all other Christians pointing a finger and saying, you don't have faith. That's why you're in trouble. And so they point a finger and say, if you only had faith, you would be driving Cadillacs. You'd be driving Lincolns. You'd have a big new home. And yet Proverbs 30 verse 8 says, Give me the balance, God. Don't let me go hungry so that I'll have to stoop to stealing, but at least don't let me have the riches so that I won't need you anymore. And I won't seek your face anymore. But he says Christians are sitting down there on earth pointing the finger at each other and they're speaking vanity. They don't even know what the Bible teaches. If you draw out your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then sure your, shall your light rise in obscurity and your darkness be as the noonday. Brethren, one of the keys, and I think this is something we're going to have to start doing, is to make sure we help our neighbors. We're going to seek the will of God, and it says right here in a fast that we must help people. Now, we must learn and seek God on how to judge between those who make a living after getting food and so on from churches and those who sincerely need help. And those who need help, we must extend a hand to them. Verse 11, And the Lord shall guide you continually, that is, if we seek His face properly, and satisfy your soul in drought, make fat your bones, and you shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fall or fail not. And they that shall be of you shall build the old waste places, you shall raise up the foundations of many generations and shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the paths to dwell in. Brethren, I think that would be a fantastic thing if we can so humble ourselves, learn true scriptural fasting, not for ourselves, but to humble ourselves before God so that He can convert us spiritually first then we will have the right approach toward all humanity that we meet and He will lead us that way and we can be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths. I think that would be a wonderful thing, but it takes a great deal of self-sacrifice and that we must be willing to look at ourselves and say, convert me. Convert me. Because apparently... Most of humanity is not willing to be converted. 
Not even when they come into a knowledge of certain basic scriptures. We hang on and hang on over a period of time. So I think the only solution is we had better become a fasting church. A fasting church so that we can humble ourselves and God will lead the path. He can raise us up and set us on high so that we can do a work of warning to this nation. And Jeremiah chapter 14. Jeremiah 14, verse 2. Well, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the drought. So there's a drought in the land of Judah. Judah mourns, and the gates thereof languish. They're black under the ground, and the cry of Jerusalem is gone, uh, is gone up. So here is Jerusalem and Judah, and they were having a great drought. Now let's drop on down to verse 16, or 10 to 16. And let's see, I just wanted to give you the background, the setting there, to let you see who this is talking about. Verse 10. Thus says the Lord unto this people, Jerusalem and Judah, thus have they loved to wander. They have not refrained their feet. Look at that now. They've not restrained themselves from their own physical pursuits. They've not changed their lives to get in harmony with the Spirit of God, but they've walked after the flesh. They've not refrained their feet. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. He, excuse me, he will remember their iniquity and visit their sins. Then said the Lord unto me, Pray not for this people for their good. God is saying, look, when people reach a certain stage, don't even pray for them. For their good, how can it be good not to pray for them? Because God is going to punish them. Once they've received punishment, then they'll cry out to God. Some people literally will not turn to God unless they go through hell on earth. And when they're down as far as they can go, there is nowhere else to go, then they cry out to God. Verse 12, when they fast, I'll not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offerings and oblation, I'll not accept them. But I'll consume them by the sword, warfare, famine, and by the pestilence. Verse 13, then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, You shall not see the sword. Isn't this what the ministers are saying today? Nothing's going to happen in, in America. We're not going to go through the tribulation. There's not going to be any problems. Neither shall you have famine, but I'll give you assured peace in this place. And that's what the prophets are saying. They stand on television. They say it on the radio. They say you're going to be raptured out seven years before Christ comes. They even say, and I've seen it in writing and heard it on radio and television, one prominent minister saying the tribulation has never started yet. This is saying peace and safety. They're lulling us to sleep. Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spoke unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of nothing. The deceit, what is it? Is it of God? Of their own heart. The deceit of their heart. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I sent them not, Yet they say, sword and famine shall not be in this land. Notice what God Almighty says. He said, I'll not hear their fast. They can fast to me six days out of the seven in a week. I won't hear it. I won't even acknowledge their fasting. All they're going to do is lose a little weight. Here's what God says is going to happen to those ministers that are preaching falsehood and deceiving and lulling Christians to sleep. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. Want to be a preacher? Better make sure you're on God's side. You better seek His face first. I mean, seek it and seek it and seek it so that you'll not lead astray. And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out into the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword, and they shall have none to bury them. Their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I'll pour their wickedness upon them. Now, brethren, this is a very devastating thing because we can see from this scripture people are sincere many times and they say, know the Lord, praise the Lord, and yet they are going to be consumed and it says so because they are false and they will not tell the truth of Scripture. They can even fast and God will not even honor that fast because they're not seeking His truth. They're only seeking to perpetuate their own traditions. 
that have led people into spiritual bondage. Now, chapter 36 of Jeremiah. Chapter 36. Verse 5 to 7 to start with. Chapter 36, verse 5 to 7. And Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I'm shut up, I cannot go into the house of the Lord. I mean, Judah was really a backsliding nation. He was very devastated in spirit and in heart and in mind because of their lack of repentance. And he wouldn't even go into the house of the Lord. He said, look, Baruch, you go for me. Therefore, go you and read in the roll which you have written from my mouth. So Baruch was going to go and read what Isaiah was given from the Lord, and he was going to read it to the people in, in the temple. The words of the Lord in the ears of the people in the Lord's house upon the fasting day. That's atonement, the day of atonement. And also, you shall read them in the ears of all Judah that come out in their cities. So wherever people come from, you go out, Baruch, just go around reading what I'm going to say. Verse 7. It may be that they present, they will present their supplication before the Lord and will return every one from his evil way. For great is the anger and the fury that the Lord has pronounced against this people. Now do you see the reason given here for fasting? So that people will return each individual and it cannot be a husband and wife together, one do it and the other not. It's an individual matter before God, and every one has to turn from his personal evil, learn what God has to say, and do it. Now, verse 9. And it came to pass in the fifth year of Jehoiachin, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, in the ninth month, that they proclaimed a fast before the Lord to all the people in Jerusalem and to all the people that came from the cities of Judah unto Jerusalem. They proclaimed a fast for the very purpose of repentance. That is the reason for fasting. So that we can look inwardly. You know, it's kind of funny, but you stop and think about how people go into the hospital and they get a heart scan so they can see what's wrong with them and God's been using heart scanners for years. He's been reading the hearts and the minds of people from the day Adam and Eve was created. <laughs> I thought that was kind of interesting. The, but anyway, uh, it's not actually the heart. You know, God reads the mind, the seat of intellect, where we think and where all of our attitudes and concepts comes from. But he's been reading our minds for a long time. But repentance is the whole key to fasting. The whole key. Now, Jonah chapter 3. I think this is interesting. This little old book stuck back there. And most of us, the only thing we know about that book was this gourd that grew up. Jonah was hot and he got under this gourd and he kept complaining to God and it dried up and went away. And yet we miss the whole crux of the book. Jonah chapter 3. Amos, Obadiah, then Jonah. Okay, Jonah chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, just to set the stage here. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid you. See, now this is what a true minister of Jesus Christ must do, no matter what, what the circumstances are. Whatever God calls him to do, he must do it. Now, verse 4. And Jonah began to enter into a, the city a day's journey. Now, this is a big city. And he cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth. That's humbling yourself. I mean, that's really humbling yourself. That's the way they did it in those days. From the greatest of them even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, took off his kingly garments, and covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. See, seek the face of God. Yes, let them turn every one from his evil from the, and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Verse 10, and God saw their works. 
that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them and he did it not. Fasting was for repentance and the entire city repented even down to the animals. God saw their works and it was a good work and it was for repentance and they fasted and God saw it and he did not render the evil to them. Now do you see what could happen if we could reach to every person in the United States of America and if this whole nation were to repent? The evil he's written in the prophecies do not have to come upon this land. They don't have to. But it will take God Almighty and all the power he has to bring it about. A couple of more scriptures and I'm going to be through here today. Zechariah chapter 7. Zechariah chapter 7. Just going to summarize a little of this. Chapter 7, starting in verse 4. Then came the word of the Lord, Lord of hosts unto me, this is Zechariah, speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth, seventh month, and so on, even those 70 years, did you at all fast unto me? Even to me? No. They were seeking their own selfish whims their own ways. And when you did eat and when you did drink, did not you eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Should you not hear the words which the Lord has cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited? Here they were 70 years in the Babylonian captivity and, and they were fasting for themselves. They still hadn't truly repented and yet God brought them back and put them in the land. Verse 8, and the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus speak the, Lo the Lord, thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment and show mercy and compassions every man to his brother. That's what God wants from fasting. He wants us to convert ourselves, him convert us through the power of his spirit, so that we can have compassion upon other people. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. And let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. Do we understand what he just said? Not one of us should ever, under any circumstance, imagine evil against a brother. Not even in our mind. This is called conversion. And that's not easy. That's why I believe we'd better start becoming a fasting church. But they refuse to listen. Look what it says. What happened to these people? They refused the true fast of God, and as a result, look what happened. And then you compare this with all the Christian churches today. Not all, but many of them. But they refused to listen, pulled away the shoulder. God put his hand on it and said, this is the way, and they pulled it away. He said, don't touch me. I don't want to know what you've got to say. And they stopped their ears that they should not hear. Brethren, that's an indictment. And all the way through to every one of the churches in the book of Revelation chapter 2 and 3, it says, He that has ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We cannot afford to be a church that's going to pull our shoulder away from God and say, I don't want to know what you've got to say. I'm going to stop my ears. I don't want to know any more truth. I don't want to change anymore. I want to be comfortable. I want to settle down with my husband, my wife, my children, my home. I just want to sit around. Go away and leave me alone. I'm a Christian. We can't do that. Our lives have been totally submerged in baptism. They're not ours anymore. We're alive to Jesus. He owns us. You have no right whatsoever to say, I want to have my comfortable little niche. If Jesus requires you to die for him, you've got to do it. He's your boss. He's purchased you from death. Brethren, this church has got to be on fire. It cannot sit back as we have been doing. Of course, we are on fire when you compare us to other churches, but it's not even right to compare ourselves spiritually with anybody else, only with God. And so we had better make sure we're on fire for God. Look at verse 12 now. Yes, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophet. Okay. I want to start drawing this to a conclusion today. Because I want to bring it down to us. What about Christians? You and me today. We've seen examples how ancient Israel sought God's face through fasting. They turned their heart. They did this first. It was a good work before God. They afflicted themselves and humbled themselves and God would listen. 
And he answered their prayer. He delivered them many times when they had a righteous king who, who led the nation. So I realize what this is saying. Do you realize? I mean, I do. Before I stood up and gave this sermon, I knew that if God had called me to the ministry to head up this group, I'd better be willing to do first what I'm asking you to do. And that means if we're going to become a fasting church, I'd better be willing to do it first. Now, let's turn to Matthew chapter 6 in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 to 18. Moreover, when you fast, not if you fast, when you do it. That means all disciples of Jesus Christ, it says here, will fast. But many times we become lazy. We don't talk about it that much because it's not a natural thing to do, go without food. When you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. If our religion, if you want to call it religion, is just to appease other people and let them see that we're godly, oh, you may as well forget it. Because God wants the heart to be converted. And once it's converted, things will come out naturally to other people. But when you fast, he says, look, don't you just stand on the street corners and be like they are. Here's what you do. But you, when you fast, anoint your head. That means comb your hair. <laughs> wash it. Comb it. Curl it if you have to to look nice for other people. And wash your face. That you appear not unto men to fast, but unto your Father which is in secret, and your Father which sees in secret shall reward you openly. This is what we must do. Now in chapter 9 of Matthew, verse 14 and 15. Then came to him the disciples of John. So this is to Jesus saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often? But your disciples, oh, well, they just don't fast. And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come. And I say that that was from the time Jesus was crucified. And when the Holy Spirit came on that day of Pentecost, that's the days all the way time, down to the time when Jesus returns. When the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then they shall fast. Brethren, we'd better start learning to fast. All of us. And often. I don't set times or anything. You'll have to do that. You'll have to learn it yourself. You'll have to strengthen yourself and ask God's Holy Spirit to strengthen you so that you can perform these things. And then God will honor us. All of us. Now Luke chapter 18, this will be the last scripture today. Luke 18, verse 9 to 14. Luke 18, verse 9 to 14. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. And brethren, if we trust in ourselves, this work we've all been called to be a part of will not get off the ground. We cannot trust in but one, that's the living God. That they were righteous and they despised others. This is self-righteousness. We cannot be this way and be pleasing in God's sight. Amen. Two men went up into the temple to pray, and one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed like this with himself. He says, God, I thank you. Look, I'm so righteous. He said, I thank you. I'm not as other men. I'm not an extorter. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not even as this publican. Can you imagine anyone going before a king and tell them how wonderful they are? Wow. And yet that's what self-righteous people do. They can never go to God in prayer because they can never think of anything they've ever done wrong. So how can you ask for repentance if you've never seen anything in your life that's wrong? That's why we've got to fast and seek God's face to show us what's wrong with ourselves so we can repent. Verse 12. I fast twice in a week. This is the self-righteous man. I give tithes of all that I possess. And I make sure I say it publicly so everybody will know I give tithes. Verse 13. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. And he smote upon his breast saying, God be merciful to me a sinner. This is what Jesus said. This publican went down to his house justified rather than the self-righteous man. For every one that exalts himself shall be abased. And he that humbles himself, and we can do it through fasting, shall be exalted. Brethren, I'm going to call 
for everyone who desires to do so for a fast on July 27th, that's a Sabbath, two weeks from today, starting at sunset the night before, Friday night, anyone who chooses to do so and fast for 24 hours. And at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, we all, everyone who hears this weekly tape in unison at that period of time, stop whatever we're doing and with one voice cry out to God so that he will bless this work that we're all called to so that we can reach out to many, many people in this country and ask them to turn to save their own lives spiritually and not have to go through the problems that's going to face this nation. Because I'm going to bring some information over the next few months that proves that we are getting so close that it is scary. And without Jesus Christ and God the Father on our side, people are going to fall by the wayside left and right. They're going to be disillusioned and give up. And we had better start seeking God's face now. So I'm asking anyone who will, July 27th, from sunset to sunset, and stop whatever you're doing. If you're not in a church service, like out in California, see, 6 p.m. is only 4 p.m. there. If they're still having a church service, they couldn't do this. But then we all ask God in unison to bless this work, first of all, to show us our own personal sins and mistakes so that we can change them. And then, once we've changed our life, then He can pour out a blessing upon us to reach other people with this message.